Well, Rowan Williams was born in Swansea and spent his, his early life there, went to school in Swansea. Um, eventually he went to Cambridge, to university, to study theology and then to Oxford to do a research degree. Um, from that time on, his life was split between the university, mostly Oxford and Cambridge, though he taught for a while in, in Murfield College up in, in Yorkshire. Uh, split between the university and the church. He was someone who straddled both worlds for quite a long time. So, for instance, he spent some time in Cambridge when he uh, taught at Westcott House, which is an ordination training college, um, then became dean and, uh, of, of Clare College, and uh, whilst dean of Clare College was also a curate in a church in, in North Cambridge. Uh, at a very young age of 36, became a professor in, in Oxford, very, you know, an unusually young age to get that kind of post, but was only there a fairly short time before being appointed as Bishop of Monmouth in, in Wales. Um, so shifted back from the sort of academic world, the peak of the academic world, over to the, the church world. And since then, he's been very much on the church side, being um, Bishop of Monmouth, being, being Archbishop of Wales, and then Archbishop of, of, of Canterbury. But while he's been on that church side of his career, he's still kept up with the academic conversations, participating sometimes in academic conferences, writing academic works. So he's kept a foot in, in both worlds. He's actually quite a difficult person to place sort of on the theological map um, because he's been very eclectic in what he's read and who he's been in conversation with. Um, it's not that easy to pin down sort of one of the great names of the previous generation and say that Williams is a follower of that person. So you can't say that he's a, a Bartian or a von Balthasarian or a Ranerian, um, though there are elements of all those people in his thinking and he's read carefully, particularly von Balthasar and, and Rana. Um, they, they had an influence on him. But he's remained quite independent of them as well. He's always been a, a critical friend of those big names. I think if uh, one pays attention to the trajectory he took, then he was an Anglican theologian right from the beginning, um, immersed in a range of Anglican authors um, and in conversation with various other Anglican thinkers um, uh, as he sort of grew to theological maturity but in conversation with orthodox thinkers, particularly Russian orthodox thinkers. He wrote his thesis on, on Losky and um, was involved in sort of Anglican orthodox conversations um, during his time as a, a PhD student. And I think the easiest way to characterize sort of where he started off theologically is, he, is that he was in that end of English and Welsh Anglicanism which was resonant with and familiar with orthodox, mystical, spiritual and monastic traditions of thinking. So in the background of a lot of his writing is quite deep immersion in those sort of spiritual traditions of orthodox writing as they've been received in and responded to by Anglican authors. And then once he had his own theological career as, a, as an academic teacher, um, he was teaching on a range of figures from the history of Christian theology, history of Christian spirituality. And so people like, um, at one end of the spectrum, maybe Luther or a medieval thinker like John of the Cross. He immersed himself in their writings, but was influenced by some of the Anglican and Orthodox authors more recently who'd written about those people. So going through a book like uh, The Wound of Knowledge, where he gives a history of Christian spirituality. Uh, dominantly, it's filled with his own interpretation of those key figures from theological history, like um, Dionysius the Areopagite, or, or, or Luther, or, or John of the Cross. But influenced by, you'll see in the footnotes, that there are essays um, by, or, or conversations with particular Anglican and Orthodox figures from the last few decades, who had shaped his interpretation. So he comes from that kind of Anglican Orthodox spiritual tradition and that gives him a, a base from which he then reads and interacts with other strands in theological thinking. So for instance he reads and responds to Karl Barth but he does so as someone formed in this Anglican Orthodox spiritual tradition 
and uh, looking for what he can learn from Bart, but also looking to critique Bart from that kind of, of position. And similarly, um, with von Balthasar, with, with Rana, later on when he, he becomes uh, a sort of fairly close reader of Hegel, um, some of the accounts you'll see of Rome Williams' thinking sort of suggest that he's a Hegelian with a capital H and that Hegel is a, a major independent influence. And that's not quite true. Certainly he's read Hegel quite carefully and you can see some Hegelian strands coming through, but they come through insofar as he can re respond to those strands positively from within this kind of existing Anglican Orthodox spiritual tradition. Um, Hegel matters insofar as Hegel helps Williams articulate and think more deeply about that existing theological tradition in which he's immersed. And it's not a theological tradition which features very prominently on the kind of maps of theology that um, most of us learn about in our uh, you know, undergraduate and graduate training. Um, it's not sort of one of those categories that, that uh, is, looms large in the, in the theological world. But there are individuals, uh, someone like um, Donald McKinnon, or before that, Austin Farrer, various thinkers in, in the Anglican world who um, feed through into the kind of theological world that Williams inhabits.